everybody. We have a very special week for you with our friend, Dr. Dale Bredesen, who's an internationally recognized expert in um, dementias and the mechanism or what causes them. He's uh, a colleague, a friend, someone I look up to, the author of the New York Times bestselling book, The End of Alzheimer's. Um, he's held faculty positions at UC San Francisco, UCLA, UC San Diego, and um, is the founding president and CEO of the Buck Institute. He's currently a professor at UCLA and um, has a brand new book, which is really an extension of the end of Alzheimer's. It's called The End of Alzheimer's Program, The First Protocol to Enhance Cognition and Reverse Decline at Any Age. One of the big things we should talk about is Alzheimer's doesn't start when you're 70. It probably starts when you're a child. And a lot of the risk factors he talks about uh, don't just show mm -hmm. up in old age. Uh, so, Dale, welcome to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. We are so excited. Thank you so much. And before we get started, though, if you, to the listeners, if you learn anything, if you have questions, please post them. We would love it if you'd post it with a, like, take a screenshot and post that for us. Tag us. You can also go to brainwarriorswaypodcast.com and leave us a review. We would be ever so grateful. And it will enter you into a drawing, either for Daniel's book, The End of Mental Illness, or my cookbook. Um, but make sure you post one thing that you've learned, because I know you're going to learn a lot today. So welcome so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bredesen. Thanks so much. It's a real honor to be on with you, too. Thank you. So the big idea is there are many roads to Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. And it really turned out to be folly looking for one drug to treat this thing that is caused by many different things. I remember hearing you lecture and you talked about the root with 36 holes in it. Um, how did you get this big idea? Yeah, you know, and this is interesting because it goes back to your seminal paper in 2011 on CTE, where you were showing that, you know, you actually have to hit multiple things to get a result. So we, of course, we came from basic test tube research, 30 years to try to understand what are the drivers? Why is it that it's been so unsuccessful to treat neurodegenerative disease? And what we came to was that if you look at the signaling of the amyloid precursor protein, the very thing that's giving the amyloid that we associate with Alzheimer's disease, it becomes very clear that there are many molecular pathways that lead to this thing. And this thing actually functions as a molecular switch. When things are good, it is cleaved at one site, gives you two peptides that say support brain synapses, grow forward, you know, just like in good times in a country, same idea. On the other hand, when things are bad, Trophic factors are low, glycotoxicity, toxins from you know, various metals and air pollution, ongoing inflammation, all the things that you've talked about before. That same molecule actually senses that. You can follow, for example, NF-kappa B directly to increasing genes that cause proteins that will cleave this now at three sites, give you a completely different picture that says, I've got to protect myself. I'm pulling back. And in fact, you know, there's such a great analogy. What has happened with COVID-19? We have all been told, pull back, mm. social distance, stay in place, be careful, isolate, et cetera. And so that's been our way to protect ourselves. But what's happened with that? We've entered a recession. We're not mm. able to have the interactions. We are literally pulling back. And that's exactly what happens in the brain in Alzheimer's. You've got an insult. You respond to it with a protection that is a protective pullback. And that's what amyloid is doing. So, so let's talk about this. We'll get a little geeky for some of our listeners. But for many years, uh, the amyloid hypothesis drove Alzheimer's research. Alzheimer's is caused by an excess deposition of this toxic protein called beta amyloid 
And so there are amyloid scans or amyloid PET scans to look at amyloid load and get rid of the amyloid and you'll get rid of Alzheimer's disease, except there has been failure after failure after failure with that model. Where do you think things went wrong? Yeah, so, and this is the problem. Uh, amyloid is not the cause of Alzheimer's. It is a mediator. And so you can say the same for tau. So in other words, when you have these various insults, and as you mentioned, you know, we often tell the patients, imagine there's a roof with 36 holes in it. You've got to patch the different holes. As there are problems, whether they be insulin resistance or exposure to toxins or reduced trophic support, and this really is a beautiful system that you can look at very clearly how this neural network is held up. When there are problems with that, you make the amyloid as a response. So getting rid of the amyloid is like saying, our company is in the red. If we just get rid of the CFO, everything will be okay. We can spend a lot. Well, you know, that doesn't help. You know, it may give you a little extra window to spend a few more dollars, but as I'm sure you guys know yourselves, that you know, there when when you just get rid of the CFO, you're not going to, in the long run, you're not going to do any better. And in fact, you may do worse. And so, in fact, getting rid of the amyloid, and we've seen a number of people, I'm sure you have as well, where at, when they get these anti-amyloid drugs, they actually take a dive with their decline. Mm -hmm. And then slowly they'll start to get a little bit before the next injection, then they'll get worse. And one of the people this happened two years ago, I asked his wife. So, you know, each time he got this, he clearly got worse. Why did you continue in this trial? And she said, the doctors know what they're doing. And so, you know, and sometimes we don't <laughs> always. And unfortunately, in this particular case, they were doing something to this poor patient that was clearly making him much, much worse. Yeah, I don't have that kind of faith. <laughs> and so um, let's talk about some of the roads to Alzheimer's. So you mentioned trophic factors. Um, explain that to our listeners. Yeah, that's a great point. So we, again, you can take the analogy to a country. You've got to have two things to make the country grow strong and you know, building new bridges and all that. On the one hand, you have to have the support side. You have to have a strong economy. You've got to have a lack of, uh, you know, of um, inflation, major inflation. Um, but you've also got to have protection from the outside. If you've got invasion, people coming from other countries, uh, that's like inflammation in the brain. Now you've got problems. That's like pathogens. So you've got to have this network. And as you know, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to keep this network up, including things like oxygenation, blood flow, et cetera. And your brain secretes these growth factors. And we kind of put these three in the same, uh, in the same group which are new critical nutrients, things like B12 and vitamin D and things like that, and omega-3s, things like that. Um, and then uh, hormones, thyroid, estradiol, progesterone, testosterone, pregnenolone, all these things, which are also supportive. And then growth factors uh, or trophic factors. And these are factors uh, that, of course, Dr. Rita levi Montalcini discovered and won the Nobel Prize for many years ago, for discovering that there are factors that bind to specific receptors in the neurons that essentially tell them things are good, support, differentiate, make, make connections, keep connections, things like brain-derived neurotrophic factor and, and, and nerve growth factor, NGF. These are critical. And of course, as you know, these are typically reduced in patients with Alzheimer's. So patients with Alzheimer's typically have both a loss of the overall support from these various things and an increase in the challenges in the various insults, such as pathogens from the mouth, herpes simplex, as you know, Borrelia uh, from Lyme disease, uh, uh, molds from the sinuses. All of these have been identified in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's. So as you wow. indicated, trophic factors critical for support. This is so important uh, because many people think that with Alzheimer's, you're a victim of it or not. Right. And what the end of Alzheimer's talks about is you can actually have some control. It's not just a program. And, and I 
suspect your new book, the program, how to actually do it step by step, which risk factors do you have and what are the things you can do to ameliorate them? So I'm assuming that also, um, I mean, I'm not assuming I know because I've, we've worked with you before. Um, you are, this is really about prevention as well. And, and really going after these risk factors as someone who my father was actually diagnosed, misdiagnosed with Alzheimer's mm-hmm. disease. Mm-hmm. So that for me is very troubling. And I know that is for a lot of people out there that you could be at all misdiagnosed with something so devastating that, or that your body could even uh, mimic that your brain can mimic something like Alzheimer's disease that you could have something else. Um, what can people do to prevent that from happening? Um, you know, besides finding a, a great doctor, but what can they do to know when it's Alzheimer's versus when it's like pseudo dementia and how can they prevent things like pseudo dementia? Yeah. You know, you brought up an excellent point because everything as you two know, everything in this field has been turned backwards. Everything is the opposite of the way it should be because we've been told that there's nothing you can do. We know we don't know the cause of this. And so what, is, what do people say? Don't bother getting a genetic test because there's nothing you can do about it. You know, is it, is it Alzheimer's when you come in? They say, well, it doesn't matter because you can't do anything about it anyway. Let's just check a few things and see if you've got something like, you know, your B12 is a little low. They don't really dive in and ask. So as you indicated, it's important to know. On the other hand, when people come in and they say, oh, uh, we did a PET scan. It's not Alzheimer's. Goodbye. Well, wait a minute. You still have cognitive decline. You still need something to yes. want to understand what's causing this. And as Daniel said, these are things that the biochemistry starts much, much earlier. So even even with the huge onslaught of childhood obesity and type 2 diabetes and exposure to various mycotoxins, these biochemical changes can start many, many years before a diagnosis. So for today, if there's a question, then probably the best thing is either PET scan, and whether it's an amyloid PET scan or an FDG PET scan, this can often pick up changes about 10 years ahead of a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or spinal fluid. And of course, most of us don't want to come in for spinal taps, um, but that also can indicate that there are the, the, ch- the biochemical changes that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. But you bring up a good point. In the clinical studies, up to 30 or more percent of people can be misdiagnosed. Uh, so they'll that's be crazy. Thought, it's, it is crazy. And they'll be thought to have Alzheimer's, then they're treated. Now, once they started doing, uh, if, if you do have a PET scan, that that drops, of course. Well, we would we would just change that a little bit. Of course, we'd expect. Yeah, right? absolutely. And I do this lecture where an FDG, not an FDG PET, but an amyloid PET scan, is about $3,000, will go Alzheimer's, yes or no, where a spec scan, and there's deep literature to support it, will go Alzheimer's pattern, frontal temporal lobe dementia, Lewy body dementia, head trauma dementia, toxic dementia, pseudo dementia, normal pressure hydrocephalus dementia. Um, It'll give you indications for all of those things. So why it's not used as a screening tool really is based on ignorance and a lack of appropriate education. When we come back, we're going to talk more about, well, what's in the program? What are specific things you can do to know if you're headed for trouble, right? The brain is one of the few organs we don't screen. We screen cervixes and we screen (laughs) hearts and we screen breasts but we don't screen the most important organ, which is your brain. Um, And then what can you do about it? Stay with us. We're here with Dr. Dale Bredesen. His new book is The End of Alzheimer's Program. And make sure you post something you've learned today. I learned a lot. Um, I'm hoping that you guys learned something. And make sure you go to brainwarriorswaypodcast.com. Leave us a review or a question. We will enter you into a drawing for one of our books. Hi, I'm Dr. Daniel Amen. In the end of mental illness, I talk about, well, what if we reimagine mental health as brain health? And this one idea changes everything. 
Welcome back. We are still here with our friend and colleague, Dr. Dale Bredesen, and we're talking about his program, The End of Alzheimer's. We talked about his book, um, what, probably a year ago, at least, and now we're talking about the program. Um, this is the how-to, and we're just having so much fun. Well, I'm having fun because I like to geek out on this stuff as a neurosurgical ICU nurse. Um, so this is this is just so interesting. But for me, this is personal, Dr. Bredesen, because as someone whose father was misdiagnosed, and when we got him on the right medications and off the wrong medications and got him doing a program that's actually very similar to yours, very similar to what you talk about before I even knew you, um, he radically transformed his life and was preaching and doing all-day seminars within a matter of months. So talk to us about what's in this program that can, that can literally give people their lives back. Right. So we have just followed in this program directly from the test tube. What are the things that drive the underlying pathophysiology of Alzheimer's? So you can literally follow, as I mentioned before, we can, you can follow uh, nuclear factor kappa B as an example. Anything that's causing inflammation from, you know, from oral bacteria like P. gingivalis or T. denticola or F. nucleatum to herpes simplex to molds that can collect in your sinuses to, of course, uh, HHV6A is another herpes virus that can get into your brains. As you know, the studies of brains even include candida, finding candida in the brain. So identifying the things that are driving the process and then simply changing that ratio of the APP signal. So you're changing from a synaptoclastic signaling where you're pulling back based on these various factors to a synaptoblastic signaling where you are growing forward, making and keeping connections. And so we start by looking at what are the dominant ones and what subtype, when you start looking, you can see that there are these subtypes of Alzheimer's disease, and then you want to address those. So for this book, I actually worked with two other people. So I was very excited to do this with uh, Julie G, who, who is a user, who's actually been using this and has gone from 35th percentile on cognitive scores to 98th percentile. She's an APOE 4-4 with a strong family history. She's doing extremely, she's now been on eight years doing extremely well. And so she has all sorts of workarounds and things that she's done that have been very helpful. And then my wife, uh, Dr. Aida Lachine Bredesen, who is an integrative practitioner. So what do you do? You actually have to look at are there, is there ongoing inflammation? And so you then want to address that inflammation. Of course, leaky gut is a huge issue, making sure that you have the appropriate microbiome. And of course, the microbiome is different in Alzheimer's disease on average than it is in control patients who don't have Alzheimer's disease. And then it's, it is supporting insulin sensitivity. It is inducing some mild ketosis because, of course, as your spec scans show, Daniel, there is an energy failure in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's. And for about 10 years uh, before or more before Alzheimer's is diagnosed. So we want to get in early. We want to support the energy. One of the things that's come out in the last several years is how incredibly common nocturnal hypoxia is in these patients. So pe patients wow. who are beginning to have cognitive decline. Well, one of our big risk factors. Right? Exactly. So, so what I hear you saying, and I'm almost listening to myself, except you yeah, said it in I, more, yeah. um, you guys are very similar way, is the first thing to do is know your important health members. Yes. That that's the first thing. And the famous business consultant uh, said, you can't change what you don't measure. Peter Drucker said, you can't change what you don't measure. And I heard you say, well, we need to check for inflammation. Yes. And um, so we use C-reactive protein. Yeah. There are other ways to check for it. Well, one thing that I heard him say, that, and I just, I want to bring this up because all of our Brainiac friends that are on our show say the same thing. And this is just so important because I know people still get tripped up by this. All of the brain doctors on our show, including us, the gut, it's the gut, like the gut brain connection. It's one if, of the things we have to pay attention from to. From a practical standpoint, people should be getting their important numbers checked, likely on a yearly yeah. basis. So some measure of inflammation. What else do you use to test for inflammation? 
Yeah, we often use uh, albumin to globulin ratio. It's, it's a time-honored and, and inexpensive way to get at the same thing. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, TNF, so tumor necrosis factor alpha uh, and uh, interleukin-6 and interleukin-8 are both increased uh, often, again, in, in an infl inflammatory state. And then, of course, uh, for people who have inflammation with respect to the uh, innate immune system, um, you can look at things like C4A, uh, or TGF beta one; those are also good ones to look at. Um, and, and one of the interesting things, as you know, that's come up with COVID nineteen, is that COVID nineteen and Alzheimer's have many parallels. And in fact, many of these comorbidities we talk about with Alzheimer's as risk factors are comorbidities that predict a poor uh, outcome from COVID nineteen. But instead of over twenty years, everything's compressed into two weeks. So things like low zinc low vitamin D, wow. obesity, type 2 diabetes, hypertension. These are all important in Alzheimer's. They are also important in COVID-19. So we want to look at these. Yeah, so interesting. That. Your yeah. best defense against COVID-19 is your immune system. Exactly uh, right. Not, and the innate. Um, yes. So, yeah. so, so inflammation, um, also omega-3 index. Because Absolutely. we did a study. 49 out of 50 consecutive patients had suboptimal levels of omega-3 fatty acids, which yeah. can increase inflammation. You also said, I have a meeting with my dentist next week, that gum disease is a major cause of inflammation. So taking care of your teeth is absolutely- Well, and critical. so many people think, oh, well, if I just eat right. I met When I met you, I, I'm not a nurse. And I went to Loma Linda, where they're very nutrition conscious. And when I met you, um, my, my omega-3 fatty acid ratio was horrific and my vitamin D was like 17. And I'm right. like, well, how is that possible? Yeah. So, you know. Because you can't change what you don't make. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so in the end of Alzheimer's program, you tell people what um, lab tests that they should get. So that, um, now, um, you mentioned infections like- yeah herpes sex, uh, so many people are positive. Mm -hmm. How do you know just because you've been exposed in the past, so you have IgG antibodies to whether it's herpes, whichever one, or CMV or Epstein-Barr, how do you know if it's significant and you should talk to your doctor about treating it? Mm -hmm. It's a great point, Daniel. Uh, and with HHV6, there is HHV6A and HHV6B. And most of us are positive and have been exposed to HHV6B. The one that is more associated with cognitive decline is HHV6A. Now they're just, in, in the research studies, they're just beginning to look at the ability to distinguish these. Right now, you're right. If you get HHV6 antibodies, they're going to be to both. They don't distinguish between A and B fairly soon you will be able to distinguish those. And the big one to worry about is HHV6A. So and this comes back to the idea that, you know, it's the innate system, both in COVID-19 where we're dying of cytokine storms and in Alzheimer's where part of the innate immune system is a beta. So you're making this amyloid as part of your innate immune system's response to these various pathogens or insults but there's the inability to hand off to the adaptive system, your T cells and B cells and, and you know, the, more, the, the more modern part of your system, which then turns off the innate system. So the problem is as long as you don't turn this off, and of course, some of the things that are, that are abnormal in Alzheimer's patients where they can't turn this off and they don't have an appropriate uh, adaptive response happen to be things like Low omega-3s, just what you talked about, and low vitamin D. These are absolutely crucial for the ability of our adaptive systems to become active. And part of what they do, they not only attack the pathogens and clear them, but they also come feed back and turn off that innate system that is giving you that chronic inflammation that is giving you Alzheimer's disease. So that's a critical part, supporting that handoff. All right. It's so interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's really groundbreaking work. Know your important health numbers. Optimize them. I think optimizing them um, 
you, you know, I wrote a book called The End of Mental Illness, and it's we just have the wrong paradigm. It's not mental illness. It's brain health. And, and I actually got the idea from that from, I wrote a book in 2004 called Preventing Alzheimer's, which is basically, if you want to do that, you have to prevent all the risk factors. Um, so the synergy between our work. Um, but as I wrote that, I'm like, oh, that's also how you prevent depression. That's also how you prevent um, ADHD or anxiety disorders. It's, you know, get the brain right. Your mind is better. Your cognitive function is better. Your marriage is better, um, right? So your program, yes, it's about cognitive decline, but it's also about mood decline. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I mean, ultimately get your brain right. Everything in your life tends to be better. All right. When we come back, we're going to talk more about the practical application of the end of Alzheimer's program. And we're going to talk about the types of Alzheimer's disease. Stay with us. Welcome back, everybody. We are here with our friend and colleague, Dr. Dale Bredesen, uh, who is the author of The End of Alzheimer's and his new book, The End of Alzheimer's Program, to really help you take a deep dive. Uh, I mean, how you can really apply it in your own life. And uh, we just adore him and grateful for his work. Um, let's talk about the different types of Alzheimer's. You know, ever since I started imaging in 1991, uh, I'm also a child psychiatrist. My expertise was on ADD or ADHD. And there was this, you know, study from NIH and it showed decreased activity in the prefrontal cortex when you try to concentrate. And so in my mind, oh, well, that's what ADD is until I scanned a couple of hundred ADD patients. And I'm like, oh, it's not one thing. Some people have the classic pattern. A lot of people had other patterns. And ultimately, I described seven types mm -hmm. of ADHD. And all psychiatric illnesses are not single or simple disorders. They all have multiple types. And the same thing is true for Alzheimer's disease. So talk a little bit about how you came to that conclusion and what are the different types of Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, you made a great point there. So when you start to ask, well, okay, why? As you know, 20th century medicine was about what is it? What's the diagnosis? 21st century medicine is about why? Why do you have this? What are the factors that are driving this abnormal biochemistry? And when you, when you look at this thing we call Alzheimer's, which is just a pathology, it can be driven, as you said earlier, by different factors. And they all, they have a final common pathway, but they can come in from different places. And so what we found is when we begin to measure these things, just as you said, you've got to look, you've got to measure. It is so helpful to do so. Then we found that there are some people where the dominant driver of the degenerative process is an inflammatory one. And they may have a leaky gut. You were talking about uh, gingivitis and periodontitis as they're now calling it leaky gums. So you got leaky gut, leaky gums, uh, things like this where you're now having this inflammatory process may be hurt. Which caused leaky brain. I love yeah, that. Exactly. Leaky gut, leaky gums, leaky brain. Brain, that's exactly right. And of course the, the blood brain barrier abnormalities are very, very early in Alzheimer's disease. So that's type one or inflammatory or hot Alzheimer's disease. And the typical person is kind of a 65 year old man who's doing all the wrong things and has an HSCRP of eight, you know, that sort of thing. They have an inflammatory profile. Then there's type two, very different story. You've gotten to the same pathology, but you've come in this case, not because you're pushing on it with inflammation, but because you cannot support the network. So you have low vitamin D or thyroid, pregnenolone, progesterone, all these things we had talked about before, uh, estradiol, uh, you know, th uh, um, uh, testosterone, all these things are critical. 
nerve growth factor, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, vitamin D, all these things are critical to support that 500 trillion plus neuron network or, or a synapse network. So it's a tremendous network that you're supporting there. And if you're low in these things, you simply cannot afford that network. And so you now downsize and Alzheimer's results from that story. That's type two. That's that is atrophic or cold Alzheimer's. And I should say the Ayurvedic physicians thousands of years ago came to the same conclusion that there are these different subtypes of dementia. Then there's type 1.5, which has, we named it that way because it has features of both. It's glycotoxic. It is sweet Alzheimer's disease. And it is because you've got on the one hand, glycation of these various proteins. And so they now change their shape. They change their function as well as their form. And you respond to them. They are now abnormal. Of course, we measure it as hemoglobin A1C, but there are lots of other proteins that are glycated, just like remoras on a shark. And so on the other hand, it has some features of type 2 because it creates insulin resistance. You can literally measure the phosphorylation change on IRS1, which is part of the signaling pathway from the insulin receptor. You're shutting down your response to insulin, which is an important growth factor for the brain. So that's type 1.5 or sweet Alzheimer's. Then there's type 3, which is toxic. And as you know, the toxins come in three groups. Metals like mercury and other inorganics, air pollution, things like that. As you know, there was a study out of Mexico City, with severe air pollution, showing a child that had Alzheimer's changes in the brain. Just really scary. And then you've got, so it's the metals and the other inorganics. Then it's the second group, organics. Amazing. We're finding people who have high levels of propylene oxide, acrolene. Uh, glyphosate, all these various organics that, again, people don't typically check for that can contribute to cognitive decline. And then the third group in there, um, of course, is the biotoxins, things like trichothecenes and ochratoxin A, mold-related toxins. So that's type mm -hmm. 3, um, which is toxic Alzheimer's. Type 4 is vascular. And of course, vascular component, so important. And, and this is a, a critical area for the future because so many people aren't checking. They're not checking their oxygenation at night. They're not getting their blood flow uh, up. They're not doing appropriate exercise. They're often having uh, big glucose swings that they don't know about until they actually do CGM, the continuous glucose monitoring, all these critical for the vascular status. And then the fifth one, of course, is one where you are a real expert, which is traumatic and which, as you know, contributes so commonly uh, to this problem. So uh, th these are the different ones. And it's helpful, of course, to know what are all the contributors, because then you can go after them. And I should say we're in the middle of the first trial in history for Alzheimer's. I'm very enthusiastic about this because, as you know, all the trials in the past have been where you have to say, here's our predetermined treatment for this problem. It's going to be this drug or it's going to be this lifestyle change or what have you. In this one, we're saying the opposite. We're saying for each person who comes in, we're going to measure all these different variables. And then we're going to address the ones that are contributing to the decline. And I think moving forward, you know, that's what we're all starting to do. Is that's look. rational. <laughs> You're going to target treatment based on the vulnerability they have. What about the, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this thinking about my types, um, yeah. infectious Alzheimer's. Yeah. There was an editorial in the Journal of Alzheimer's, sign, but, but, but there's other infections. So like Lyme, I bet COVID-19 is going to oh, become yeah. part of the future because there yes. is, we scanned yes. our first COVID-19 uh, positive brain with cognitive symptoms. It was terrible. The scan really? was terrible. Do you think um, at some point there may be an infectious type? Oh, absolutely. And this is part of, uh, in, right now, this is part of type one, the inflammatory type, because the infections typically drive the inflammation. But I, I absolutely agree. Many, many people uh, have Alzheimer's in association with infections. Again, HSV-1, uh, Professor Ruth Itzaki has spent her career looking at this. And you're absolutely right about COVID-19. It's really concerning because you go back to post-encephalitic Parkinson's mm -hmm. from 100 years ago. Are we going to have post-COVID Alzheimer's disease? 
And uh, one of the most concerning things I heard recently was from someone on the front line saying that a lot of the people who are coming off the ventilators and no anesthesia, no hypoxia, but just not waking up the way they mm-hmm. should, which mm-hmm. really suggests a significant amount of brainstem pathology. And even though they then ultimately do wake up, what's their concern down the road? Where are they going to stand? And I'd be interested, Daniel, in your scans on COVID-19, do you see brainstem changes? You know, we'll have to look. Uh, we're mm-hmm. just starting that work. That work. But like with Lyme, for example, initially not because there are a lot of COVID-19 people without symptoms um, or they just have mild flu-like symptoms. But if you're losing your sense of smell, um, that's well, how do you know? Brain. How do you know if you're not if you're having cognitive changes? And, and that process. will we see something right. later the road. on like Lyme? You actually put a map of the United States with the highest incidence of schizophrenia. It's the Northwest, the North Midwest, and the West Coast. And then you overlay the highest incidence of Lyme in the United States. It's almost identical. Identical. And so I think, like your subtypes for Alzheimer's, I think it's also true for serious psychiatric illnesses. Um, It's just curious. We're going to be paying attention really closely to COVID-19. And quite frankly, it's one of the reasons I don't want it. I know (laughs) there's a lot of controversy in society. They're having COVID-19 parties. It's like, you know, I just don't think uh, that's the smart thing. The smart thing is wash your hands and avoid it if you can. Yes, I'll pass this time around. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, Oh my goodness. I love these types. And and I think one that's often overlooked is the, your type five, is that having a traumatic brain injury. And I think Tana and I had this you discussion when we first met. You know, I asked her if she ever had a brain injury, because <laughs> that's part of my dating ritual. But, but, okay, but I, in my defense, I'm a neurosurgical ICU nurse. What do you think we think a brain injury looks like? Yeah, of course. You've got a brain drain, you've got a you know, skull flap, you've got, and I've, so I've never had that. And I walked so, away from a car accident. And, I walked away. And what happened? We rolled two and a half times at 75 miles an hour, but I walked away. Wow. So. <laughs> that's, yeah, Daniel, then, say, that's, that's a great pickup line. Have you ever had a brain injury? <laughs> that's a new no, it's, it's it's best that. pickup line ever. Can I see your naked brain? <laughs> Uh (laughs) that's different than the chemist's pickup line is tell me if it smells like chloroform right exactly (laughs) but but really when he brought that up and he really he pointed out he just stared at me when i mentioned the car accident because he had to ask me over and over and over and he's like ever been in a car accident i'm like yeah but i walked away from it and he just kept staring at me and then i had to think about it i'm like you know i am a nurse shaken baby syndrome is a thing right so basically that's what i had was Probably shaken baby syndrome, right? Yeah. It's something similar. Well, you got to stay. <laughs> the book is called The End of Alzheimer's Program, Bill Bredesen, Groundbreaking. Um, you should buy this book, and then you should buy it for people you love. Uh, yeah, that's good. Because brain health. get your brain right. Yes, your memory will be better but your mood will be better. Your focus will be better. Uh, your relationships will be better because ultimately that's a brain function. Stay with us. When we come back, uh, we're going to talk about uh, more ways to end Alzheimer's. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are still here with our friend and colleague, Dr. Dale Bredesen, and we are talking about his book, The End of Alzheimer's Program. And in this episode, we're going to actually answer questions. Um, So one question I have, Dr. Bredesen, is really, um, we often talk about how even if you've been bad to your brain, you can still make it better. So you're not stuck with the brain you have. But in your program, tell us about some of the cases that you know of. I'd love to hear about a specific case where someone's been really pretty bad to their brain or they're they're pretty far down the road with Alzheimer's where their symptoms are really awful and you've seen significant improvement. I actually 
heard you before we came back on talking about Lewy body dementia. Tell us something that gives people hope that if they were bad to their brain in their twenties or thirties, and they know they're headed to the dark place, that they've got hope for coming back if they do this program. Yeah, great point. Um, and let me just mention one of the, one of the people who uh, wrote this with me, uh, the handbook section of it, uh, J- Julie G, who's the one who founded APOE4.info and is herself a 4-4. Um, she had a long history. She had insulin resistance. She you know, gained a little extra weight, as so many of us do. She had ongoing systemic inflammation. Uh, her gut was not in a great shape. She was eating the wrong foods. Uh, she was uh, having, uh, she turned out to have, she had a tick bite, which uh, mm. gave her Lyme that was treated, but she didn't realize until actually she got on the program and we found out she also had gotten Babesia, um, which now being treated for doing very well. So she had all these risk factors. Not only did she start to decline, in fact, her husband would come home from a trip abroad and say, oh yeah, I've been gone for a week or two. You're clearly worse than you were. And she didn't, this was now, she was having problems in her late forties and unfortunately other family members having problems, just a really sad story. She got to the point where she had to put a sticky on the steering wheel that said drive on the right side of the road. Oh, wow. She she had been doing some jogging on the left side of the road and she had to make sure that she didn't get those two mixed up. So she was really struggling and having some issues and she would go shopping, come back and hadn't brought the thing that she bought you know, back home with her. So really significant problems. She scored on her cognitive tests uh, only at a 35th percentile for her age at that time. Um, she then has now eight years on the program doing exceedingly well, scoring 98th, 99th percentile repeatedly, doing absolutely beautifully. She corrected her dietary her exercise part, her stress levels. She corrected her insulin sensitivity. She optimized her nutrients and her vitamin D and her omega-3s and all those things. She ultimately treated her Babesia. She started doing some brain training. All of these things were critical. She checked her toxin status. She has a high fiber, a diet that we call Keto Flex 12-3 because it gives you mild ketosis. And she clearly does better, as so many people do, with some degree of ketosis, typically in the 1.0 to 4.0 millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate range. So she has just become really an international emissary for doing the right things and having dramatic improvements in your brain. And you mentioned, what about someone who's really far along? I got a, a critical letter a couple of months ago from a guy who said, my wife is in a nursing home, had a MOCA score of zero. We put her on this program and you tell people get on as early as possible. He said, well, we put her on and she's clearly better. She's dressing herself again. She's interacting with us again. She's speaking again, all these improvements. Now her MOCA score is still low, but she's clearly symptomatically much better than she was. So even with late, now to be fair, the later, as you know, the later, the harder it is to get things turned around. Everybody in the early stages can be turned around. We see it again and again and again and again with people who have subjective cognitive impairment or mild MCI. So tremendous amount you can do, as you indicate. And often the worst thing to do is isolation, put them in a nursing home where they get to choose their food (laughs) because what they choose are the high carb pro-inflammatory foods. Um, Let's talk about diet. I think probably your next book is going to be the end of Alzheimer's cookbook. And um, I mean, why not? Right. Because food is such an important part of this. What, what do you think is the best brain health diet to keep your brain young? And I heard you say mild ketosis. Give, give our listeners an actual example of what you would suggest, like actually what you would have for breakfast, lunch, dinner, because we know what that means. But We need them to hear practically what that means. Yeah. And so, again, you know, you want to be in the 1.0 to 4.0 millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate. Um, We're just actually testing an interesting breathalyzer that might make this much easier, I hope. Uh, And as far as what to eat, I think we've all come to the same conclusion that simple carbs are really damaging for your brain. And of course, MRI studies show it. Your spec scan studies show it. Uh, All these things show that this is a problem. So what you want to do, and I know during COVID-19, one of the things I found very interesting is just to do chronometer. 
free you know, app you can look at you know, uh, and just basically record what are you having each day and you can look at your percentage. So you want a high good fats diet, mm -hmm. um, a low carbohydrate diet. And we're talking about typically about 75% of the calories coming from good fats, about 10% coming from carbs, and about 15% or so coming from proteins, somewhere in the kind of 0.8 to 1 gram per kilogram of good proteins and make them, you know, good, you know, fish, uh, or if it's going to be chicken, pastured chicken, and if it's going to be beef, grass-fed beef, so that you've got a good omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. And if, for the fish, of course, the smash fish. So for breakfast, um, actually, my wife has breakfast every morning and typically has a salad. Uh, and uh, I think it's a great idea. So many of these breakfast foods we've come to, to know and love uh, can just skyrocket your, your uh, glucose. They have high glycemic indices. So you don't want to go and and you know, get up and have something like uh, you know a, a breakfast cereal that's got a lot mm -hmm. of carbs in it. You want to have something that's going to be uh, good fats, you know, eggs, uh, and get some good pastured eggs, which I I love for breakfast. I think it's a great way to go. Uh, and then sort of uh, like eggs and avocado with a little spinach. Absolutely, eggs, avocado, spinach, um, and you know, good oils to go with a, a salad. So then you know, for lunch maybe you have. Uh, a big, you know, again, make salad the big part of your plate, uh, and you know, you, you can uh, you can have some have some fish at lunch with your salad. Mm -hmm. um, best to have the smash fish, of course, as you know, the salmon, mackerel, uh, anchovies, sardines, and herring, uh, and just stay away mm -hmm. from the high mercury fish, of course, um, which are the ones, you know, the the shark and the and the tuna uh, and the and the swordfish and things like that. Uh, and then you know, for dinner. Um, you might have uh, you might have something like uh, some pastured chicken, uh, and you know again you you, you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to have a, a a plate full of uh, chicken or steak. Um, have you know greens? Maybe you have some uh, you know maybe you have some broccoli. Uh, the crucifers are fantastic, as you know, for detox. Um, and of course, the whole lectin issue has been really interesting. Some mm -hmm. people are very sensitive to these, some people not. And so it's good to see whether you are sensitive to lectins or not. Um, and so one thing that we've often wanted, because people always say, well, well, I don't understand how much protein that is. And if people aren't where they can measure and actually figure it out, I always tell them to shake hands with protein. What do you say about that? Absolutely. Yeah. A good way to measure if you're out? A card deck. You know, something like that is right. a, kind of the right amount. So, you know, card deck size is going to give you something like uh, four ounces or so. Right. Uh, I you actually have a little scale. Right, but if you're out. Kitchen counter. Well, you have to learn, and it's better to learn at home. Right. And during the pandemic, um, I, I noticed my weight started to go up. And what I do is I put a tape measure around my waist. And all of you who are listening, do not go by your pant size. The clothing industry knows you're irritated by your weight and they just lie. So a 34 may actually be 37. And one of the pastors I treat, I'm like, hey, what's your waist size? He said 40. And I put a waist, I put a tape measure around his waist i barely could get it around it was 48 i'm like dude because he was four going under feet yeah. around and measure at your belly button but i'd put on like an inch and a half which really irritated me and so what i do when my weight starts to go up is i actually start counting everything i put in my mouth because i think of calories like money and i'm a value spender and and as you weigh and measure things, you really know what you're putting in your body. That's how you, if you're having trouble maintaining your weight, eating like Tana talks about or right. Dale talks about, We're then right make same. sure you're not eating too much because sometimes the oils are very calorie dense and you have to be careful. So, and so between the two of us, we sort of balance each other out. My, my issue isn't the, like, I don't, count calories because I sort of already know in my head how many calories things are essentially. Um, for me, it's more the quality of the calories. And so between the two of us, you know, he's always paying attention to the calories. And I, and I do agree well, they, no, they I matter. I pay attention to, cal to the quality. Right. So that between the two of us. More. Right. Right. So, but you can eat more and it doesn't really show up in your weight. 
for me because I have obesity. And well, I also family, exercise a lot. But I also have obesity in my family. So it's just something for me. I know it's one of the risk factors. So I would totally have this sweet type of Alzheimer's disease. My grandfather was a candy maker. And so my best memories were making candy with my grandfather. And so I have to really work on that part. Right. And so between the two of us, we sort of balance out with that. And, and you know, Daniel, what you were describing, this is the COVID cushion. That yes. Everyone about. The COVID-19. <laughs> the COVID cushion we're all getting from, you know, being at home. And, and part of it, of course, is anxiety. And these it is. Of, but you it know is. And you were just talking about the the quality of the calories. And one of the things that's come out of this, you, know, you look at all the different things, the iodine that you need, the magnesium. So many of us are deficient in zinc and magnesium. And I think the one that has been of most concern right now to me is choline. Uh, you know, you need about 550 milligrams a day of choline. Most of us are deficient in that. And this is a huge problem because you cannot make the acetylcholine that is the most important transmitter for memory and is reduced in Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. So I really suggest to everyone, please make sure you are getting enough choline each day. And you can do that with a shrimp. supplement, but you can do it with the shrimp eggs. or eggs, eggs right? yeah. liver, you know, organ mm -hmm. meats, things like that, um, oysters, things like that. Um, so there, there are a number of ways, but you're absolutely right. Of course, Professor Richard Wortman from MIT spent so many years looking at synaptic, what's required to make synapses. And his, and his uh, ultimate conclusion was critical to have citicoline and to have omega-3s. So if you're not getting enough choline, you could take citicoline, you can take lecithin, you can take phosphatidylcholine, you can take GPC choline. So lots of ways to get your choline, but please get enough choline. Great. Well, you have just been such a blessing uh, to us and to so many people who have read your book, worked your program. The new book is called The End of Alzheimer's Program. Uh, it's by Random House. You can get it anywhere. Great books are sold. Um, how else can people learn about you and your work? Uh, where can they go? Yeah, thank you so much, Daniel and Tana. Just absolutely great talking to you guys. Uh, always enjoy it. Thank you. Um, you can go to drbredison.com. You can go to mycognoscopy.com. You know, we all know about getting a colonoscopy. You want to get a cognoscopy, see where you stand, as you indicated earlier. So mycognoscopy.com or drbredison.com or apollohealthco.com. Okay, I'm going to spell that out. It's Dr. B R E D E S E N.com drbredison.com just so people can find you so you. please um post something you've learned today post a question um tag us if you will or send a screenshot go to brainwarriorsway.com brainwarriorswaypodcast.com and leave us a review question comment we would love to hear from you if you're enjoying the brain warriors way podcast please don't forget to subscribe so you'll always know when there's a new episode and while you're at it, feel free to give us a review or five-star rating as that helps others find the podcast. If you're considering coming to Amen Clinics or trying some of the brain healthy supplements from BrainMD, you can use the code PODCAST10 to get a 10% discount on a full evaluation at amenclinics.com or a 10% discount on all supplements at brainmdhealth.com. For more information, give us a call at 855 Nine seven eight one three six three.